Today we'll cover section 2.5 in the Log 5 textbook, and this section is on scatter plots and correlations. So these are ways to visualize and numerically quantify the relationship between two quantitative variables. So the key concepts in this section are going to be scatter plots and correlations. And you can see the individual components that sort of go along with them. So we'll begin by first looking at an example. And so this is an example of a scatter plot. And this is a scatter plot of data from Old Faithful, which is a geyser that's in Yellowstone National Park. And what we see on the x-axis is the waiting time to the next eruption, which has been measured in minutes. And then on the y-axis, we see the eruption time that's also been measured in minutes. And what we're looking for here in this scatter plot is we're looking for the relationship between both of these variables. So we see both the x and the y variables are going to be uh, quantitative variables. And so what we're doing is we're plotting all of those points, all of those paired points of the x's and the y's together. And you can see that here. So this is a scatter plot. And we're looking for a few different things in this particular scatter plot. And what are they? We're looking to see, is the relationship linear, nonlinear, or isn't there a relationship in that? So let's go back. So first, does it look like there's a linear relationship between these two variables? And by a linear relationship, we're basically asking ourselves, can we draw a straight line through it? Whether one, it's one that's increasing um, in our y as we're increasing x, or one that's going down, such that as our x is increasing, our y is decreasing. So what we're looking for is, is there a line like that? So if you look at this data, you can actually see a line that does kind of go through here like this. There does appear to be a relationship. There does appear to be a linear relationship between waiting time to next eruption and the eruption time. And, the, and that relationship is such that as the waiting time to your next eruption increases, the length of the eruption will increase as well. So in other words, the longer we're waiting for the eruption at Old Faithful, the more the eruption is going to be magnificent, the longer it will be. So we see that there's this, there's this linear relationship. That's the first thing we want to look at. And then we want to say, is the general trend, when we look from left to right, is that positive? Is it going upward or is it going downward? So if we look here, we can see that it's going upward. So we would describe this as a positive linear trend. The next thing we want to know is, is there a lot of variability around the general trend? In other words, if we come back here, is there a lot of variability around our line? So we're looking for a lot of variability around this line. Okay, so the tighter that variability is, or the smaller that variability is, I should say, the tighter and closer it is to the line, the stronger the correlation will be. So when I'm looking at this, I see that those points actually look pretty tight to one another. They look to be reasonably uh, close to one another. So I would say there's not much variability and that the, str the relationship appears to be quite strong. Okay. Now, one thing I want to note when you're looking at this is that sometimes students have this tendency to want to draw distributions over this. They want to make like basically density curves or, or histograms over these points. But make sure that what we're talking when we're talking about variability here, we're talking about variability around this line. Whenever you see a scatter plot, always draw a line in it. The next thing we want to ask ourselves is are there any values that are distinct from the rest of the general pattern? In other words, are there any outliers? In this particular plot, I don't see any I don't see necessarily any outliers. It looks like we're seeing a fairly strong um, positive linear relationship. And I say strong because as the variability is weak, that means it's stronger. So if there's less variability around the line, it's stronger. If there's more, it's weaker. And we don't see any outliers. So that's how I would describe this particular scatter plot. Now let's think about this again with a, with a couple more data sets. So this is data that's actually presented in your textbook. This is presented on page 109, and this is uh, basically just a, me redoing figure, uh, figure 2.49. And so what we have here is the relationship between average mercury in three of the plots on the y-axis and then some other variable in the x-axis. 
And then there's in this lower right hand corner, there's alkalinity by acidity. So let's look at each of these plots and let's see what we can figure out. So the first thing we want to ask ourselves is, does it appear like there's a, a relationship between these two variables in this top left plot? Well, if I look at this average mercury and acidity, it looks like the relationship is such that it goes down, right? It appears that as acidity increases, the average mercury, and this is, this is, I'm so, sort of, uh, blah, blah, sorry, I should have mentioned this at the start. This is water quality data from 53 lakes in Florida. So what we're seeing is that the mercury in the lake, which is a very toxic thing, as the acidity of the lake increases, the, uh, the mercury decreases. And I say acidity, but if you're actually looking here, you see that the acidity is the pH. So it's not really acidity in the sense that if acidity is increasing, if the pH is increasing, it's actually getting more basic, right? So think of here probably just pH as being uh, the measure of acidity. Um, so we're looking through this, right? We see that there's this negative linear relationship. I would say this is a linear relationship. Now, there's a lot of variability around this line. So I would maybe think that this relationship could be, I don't know, maybe moderate or maybe it could be a weak linear relationship. And there doesn't necessarily appear to be any outliers in this, in this plot. Next, if I'm looking at uh, the average mercury in a lake versus the alkalinity in the lake, this also looks like it's negatively associated, right? such that as you're increasing alkalinity, the average mercury is, de is decreasing. However, if you're looking at this, you're seeing that there's quite a bit of variability. So if you drew a line like this through these points, you're seeing that there's quite a bit of variability at the very beginning and much less at the end. And you're also very clearly seeing a couple outliers here. So those two outliers are definitely going to be an issue that will affect this relationship. And when we're looking at this plot, there are things that we most certainly need to take note of. The next thing to look at is this acidity versus alkalinity plot down here. This one is kind of interesting because this one doesn't really seem to have a linear relationship, right? It appears to be kind of increasing in a nonlinear relationship. It appears to have this curvature to it. And because there's this curved pattern, it's not appropriate to sort of use what we're going to call the correlation as a measure of the relationship between these two variables. Finally, we have this um, plot of standardized mercury and average mercury, and we see that this is a very strong linear relationship. Those values are very close um, to, the, uh, to the line. So hopefully this gives you a sense of looking at scatter plots and trying to interpret them. And, um, and if you have any questions about this, please let me know. We're going to be spending some time working on an activity where you're going to gain experience looking at a plot and trying to understand what the relationship is that you're seeing in there and the strength of that relationship. So what is that strength of that relationship called? You've probably learned about a correlation, and that's exactly what this is measuring. It's measuring, or what we're looking for, I should say. We're looking for the linear association between two variables. And that, very, that thing that measures the linear association, as well as the direction that measures both the strength and the direction of that linear association, is what's known as a correlation. And the correlation we're going to represent as this letter R. So R um, is, uh, is going to represent the correlation. And this row is actually looks like this. It's not, it's not row written out like that. That's a typo. But it should be written like this for the population parameter. So remember that the sample statistic, the sample correlation, is going to be an estimate of the population correlation, rho. So the sample statistic is an estimate of rho. And I want you to note right now that we have rho, but we also have p. So rho is a correlation, but p is a proportion. So make sure you, you um, try not to confuse these two things. It's going to be very easy to confuse them. So just try not to. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if we're ever dealing with two quantitative variables, you know you're always dealing with uh, correlation. So a little bit about the correlation. The correlation can range between negative 1 and 1. The closer that the correlation is to negative 1 or 1, the stronger the linear relationship between the two variables. So if we were to go back here, 
we would look at this average mercury and acidity figure, the one in the top left, and we would say that's going to have a negative correlation between these two variables. And that that correlation might be kind of moderate because there's a lot of variability around the line. And then if we're going to look at the alkalinity in average mercury, we're going to see, okay, well, you know, there looks like there's a bit more variability, especially at the top there. Uh, and, and also, you know, upon second look, it also kind of has a bit of a, a, a curve trend. And maybe you even noticed this before too. There's this little bit of this curve trend. So maybe it's not even appropriate to use a correlation here. So let's forget about that one. Let's not use the correlation for that one. So let's look at the acidity and alkalinity. Well, that one also is a nonlinear. So let's not use that one either. But then we've got this average mercury and standardized mercury. Well, this has a strong linear association. So we're going to use the correlation there. So a value of zero indicates that there's no relationship between two variables. And that would essentially be a scatter plot that looks like this. So you've got your X variable and your Y variable here. And your points look like this. So what this is saying is that as X is increasing, Y is essentially staying the same. There's no association between X and Y. That's what a correlation, this would give a correlation of zero. One thing to note is that the correlation doesn't have a unit, so you're not gonna give it a unit. And it doesn't matter um, what the scale of the two variables are. So if they're in inches or if they're in feet or something like that, if you're measuring height, it doesn't matter, you're still gonna get a cor the same correlation. And something else that's important is that the correlation is symmetric. That means the correlation between X and Y is the same thing as the correlation between Y and X. So if we were to go back here and we are looking at the standardized mercury and the average mercury plot again, if we were to just put the standardized mercury on the Y axis and the average mercury on the X axis, the correlation between those two is still going to be high. And it's still probably, I'm guessing that correlation is, in the, is around a 0.9. So here are some things to look out when you're doing a, um, when you're working with correlations. A correlation is just a measure of an association. It says nothing about the causation. It doesn't say that the x variable causes the y variable because typically, just going back um, one more time, we'll go back actually to this first one. We typically keep the response variable on the y-axis and the explanatory variable on the x-axis. And you probably learned that in school. So what we're not saying by having a strong co correlation is that the explanatory variable is causing the response variable. Now that's an important thing to keep in mind. So what does cause? How do we get causation? Hopefully you remember that causation comes from study design. And in particular, for study design, we are talking about an experiment. So if we're dealing with an experiment, um, a randomized experiment, so something with random assignment, then we're going to be in a situation where we can conclude causation. Correlation only captures the linear association between two variables. It only captures if X and Y have a, a line relationship with one another. It doesn't capture, for example, those relationships we saw where it was sort of this linear, this uh, curve of linear relationship um, that looked like this for one of the figures and it looked like this for the, another one, okay? Those are not appropriate to use a correlation. The correlation is going to be heavily influenced by outliers. So what that means is if you've got a bunch of points here and then you have a point up here you might think, ignoring that one point I just drew there, the correlation would look like this. It'll be very small. But in fact, because of this one point, that's probably gonna pull the correlation up. So it's going to dramatically pull a line. And so you're going to think there's, a, there's an association between two variables, when in fact there is not. Because that's what the correlation is. It's our measure of the association, the linear association between two variables. So let's dig into this just a little bit deeper and look at one more scatter plot before we move on to actually trying to tease apart the correlation formula. So this is data from Ashton et al. And it looked at the carapace length of tortoises. So the carapace is like the shell. 
of a, of a, of a tortoise. So it looked at the relationship between the, the carapace length and the number of eggs uh, in each of these female tortoises. So if we look at this plot, we see that we have carapace length on the x-axis, and we have the number of eggs in each female that is on the y-axis. So if you look at this relationship, I hope that when you see this, you kind of see this horseshoe. It looks like as carapace length increases to a certain point, the number of eggs increases. And then as, car and then as carapace length continues to increase, the number of eggs decreases. So we have a essentially what's a quadratic relationship between these two variables. You don't need to know that. You just need to know that it's a curved line, that it's a nonlinear association. So in this situation, it's not appropriate to use a correlation. Can't use the correlation. And in fact, in the extreme case where you have a relationship like this, the correlation between X and Y ends up being zero, zero in a quadratic relationship. But we know that that's actually not true because there's clearly an association between the carapace length and the number of eggs. Now, I wonder if anybody has a theory as to what might be going on here. Why is it that as carapace length increases, uh, the number of eggs increases to a certain point, but then as carapace length continues to increase, the number of eggs decreases? Well, if you know, if you know something about tortoises, their carapace length continues to increase for their entire life. And so what we're seeing is actually older females. And we're seeing that as older females are getting older and aging, their shells are getting bigger, but also the number of eggs that they're having is getting fewer. So that kind of makes sense. And that's why we're seeing this nonlinear, this quadratic relationship, which again, it's not okay to use the correlation with. So let's look at the formula for this. So this is the uh, correlation formula. I call it Pearson's correlation because you might learn about other types of correlations, um, but it's just the same correlation. It, it doesn't, you don't need to remember the word Pearson. You can just remember it as the correlation. So let's look at the formula a little bit. So we see R is equal to one divided by N minus one times the sum, that's what that sigma is, from I to N, so from how, over however many data values you have, it's going to be x sub i minus x bar, so the data value of x minus the mean of x, divided by the standard deviation of x, times this y, the data value for y minus the mean of y over the standard deviation of y. I hope you can look at this formula and say, oh, that's a z-score of x. Oh, that's a z-score for y. So we see that what we're doing is we're taking the product of these different z-scores, we're adding them all up, that's what the sigma is doing, and then we're dividing by n minus one. So essentially, what we're doing is we're taking the average of the, uh, of the, uh, of the sum of the product of the x and y's. So we're taking essentially that average z-score product. Now, if we look at this formula, what can we tell about the correlation? I mentioned that the correlation is affected a lot by outliers. What in this formula is, a, is going to be affected by outliers? Hopefully you said these two things, this x and this y. Yeah, the mean is not resistant to outliers. So because the mean is not resistant to outliers, anything that uses the mean, including the standard deviations, are not going to be resistant to outliers. So the correlation is not. So let's see how we can actually apply this formula. Now I want you to know that this is really just a toy example for, for class, and I would never actually expect that you would calculate a correlation. Uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not that I don't think it's an important idea. I just don't know why you would do it when you can use a computer to do it. Uh, there's so many more important things to learn in, in STAT 120 than how to actually use this formula. So I'm gonna show you how to do it uh, once. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna create Z product, Z scores. So we've got this data set here. It consists of three values. 
three values of, of x and three values of y. I said that the formula for a correlation is 1 divided by n minus 1, the sum of i equals 1 to n, so we have n equals 3 here. And then it's going to be x sub i minus x bar over the standard deviation of x times y sub i minus y bar over the standard deviation of y. And we know n is going to equal 3 because we have 1, 2, 3. So let's expand out this formula a little bit. Particularly, we're going to start with this part right here. So it's going to be, um, and I should mention too, before I even jump into that, that if you look at the table below the one that contains the data, I have the mean. So this value right here is x bar. This value right here is the standard deviation of x. This value right here is the mean of y. And this value right here is the standard deviation of y. So we have everything we need to actually calculate the correlation in this table right here. So let's do it. It's going to be 3 minus 7. Or actually, I'm going to make it even a little bit more simpler. We're going to do x sub 1 minus x bar over standard deviation of x times y sub 1 minus y bar over s sub y plus x sub 2 minus x bar over the standard deviation of x times y sub 2 minus y bar over the standard deviation of y plus x sub 3 minus x bar over the standard deviation of x times y sub 3 minus y bar over the standard deviation of y. This is what we mean when we are referring to this. This part right here is that up there. So if we want to go and put in the values, I'm going to move down here so that we have a little bit more room. <clears throat> this becomes 3 minus 7 over 9.64 times 8 minus 6.67 divided by 3.21. And note you're going to do the subtraction in the numerator before you do the division. Plus 0 minus 7 over 9.64. And that's going to be 3 minus 6.67 divided by 3.21. Plus 18 minus 7 divided by 9.64 and finally 9 minus 6.67 6.67 divided by 3.21 so if you sum all of that up if you take if, so these are going to be z scores right so this is going to be the z score for x1 the z score for y1 the z score for x2 the z score for y2 and the z-score for x3, and the z-score for y3. You take their products, and you add them together, you're going to end up getting 1.486. So that's the sum of the products of the z-scores. So now we've got this whole part, 1.46, is what that equals. So now it becomes 1 divided by n minus 1, times 1.486, which is going to equal 1 over 3 minus 1 times 1.486, which is going to equal 1 over 2 times 1.486, which is going to equal 0.742. So the correlation is 0.742. As you can see, this is a lot of work. This is a lot of work for just doing three numbers. Um, so you can imagine the situation where we actually have a normal data set of, say, 20, 40, 100. Uh, I would never have you do this by hand because it would just take too long. It's nice to see how it works, um, but I think the thing to think about intuitively, uh, other than thinking about the correlation as just measuring the strength and the uh, 
the strength and magnitude, I mean the strength and direction, excuse me, strength and magnitude are the same thing, but the strength and direction of the linear association between two variables is it really re represents the average of the product of their z-scores. That's what it represents, is the average of the product of the z-scores. So if you have any questions about this, please let me know, and we will be working on an activity in class that will look at correlations and give you some time looking at scatter plots, interpreting uh, scatter plots and stuff like that. Uh, so hopefully after doing that, you'll feel much more comfortable with scatter plots. You'll feel much more comfortable with the notion of correlations.